good morning, and thank you all for joining us today, also our uh, live stream audience. I'm Atlantic Council President and CEO uh, Fred Kemp. Um, uh, thanks for joining us, both here in the room and virtually, uh, for our conversation. If you want to use social media, uh, use hashtag AC Iraq, hashtag AC Iraq. Uh, you know it's an important event when the ambassador is here, when uh, key members of our uh, board are here, uh, and it's always such a pleasure to have uh, our International Advisory Board member, uh, Majid Jafar, here. Uh, uh, Crescent, thank you for Crescent Petroleum support for this, for Iraq Initiative Global Energy Center. Majid has been a person I've been stealing ideas from for a long period of time. He happens to be one of the best uh, thinkers and actors both in the business world as an, an analyst of the region and it's always a ple pleasure to have Lean here as well so thank you so much for being here his wife Lean. Um, today's event was organized by the council's Iraq initiative and the council's global energy center uh, our Iraq initiative is led by uh, Dr. Abbas Kadim who will be our moderator today and it's really really been a game change for us in this set of work to have Abbas working working with us uh, he's one of those rare individuals who understands uh, the workings of the country. He's covering uh, Iraq so uh, uh, intimately, but also the workings of Washington, which in many respects is sometimes more difficult to, to follow. Uh, this morning's discussion is very timely. Iraq is facing its most daunting challenge since ISIS, with protests currently underway in many parts of the country, and citizens demanding reform as well as uh, the news just yesterday that Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi uh, will resign. Despite the current unrest and uncertainty about the future, Iraq has made si significant progress in recent years by carrying out elections and a peaceful transfer of power in a region where this is not the norm. We, you know, we have to keep reminding ourselves of how unique that is. Uh, the United States and Iraq have a long and complex history, we all know that. Iraq's relations with uh, Iran have strained aspects of U.S.-Iraq relations, uh, yet it is more important than ever for the United States and Iraq to work together as partners. As we saw, for example, during the U.S. mission last weekend that resulted in the death of ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, U.S.-Iraqi cooperation was one key ingredient for the success of that operation. We don't spend a lot of time on individual bilateral relations uh, at the Atlantic Council across our 13 uh, programs and center, centers that act on issues in all regions of the world. Uh, what we do is we focus on the bilateral relations that we think have outsized importance, and there is no doubt that that's the case in Iraq, and therefore our Iraq initiative. Today our expert panel will help us understand these dynamics and more. Uh, before I turn the floor over to Abbas to moderate the discussion with our panelists, I'd like to briefly uh, introduce them. Brenda Al-Rahim uh, is a former ambassador of Iraq to the United States, uh, as well as a member of our Iraq Initiative Advisory Committee. She is also the co-founder and president of the Iraq Institute. Uh, Joey Hood, we're already, always happy when uh, someone can break loose of their uh, government offices to come here. We know how demanding your jobs are. He's the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the State Department's Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. He spent uh, much of his career working in the Middle East and particularly on the Arab Arabian Peninsula. He has served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Iraq and in Kuwait, as well as Consul General and Principal Officer in Dharan, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Majid Jafar is the CEO of Crescent Petroleum and Vice Chairman of the Crescent Group of Companies. In addition, Majid serves on the Board of Trustees of the Queen Rania Foundation, the Kalamat Foundation, the Arab Forum for Environment and Development, and the Iraq Energy Institute. He also sits on the Board of Fellows of Harvard Medical School and the International Advisory Board of the Prince's Trust International and, of course, the Atlantic Council's International Advisory Board. Um, the, uh, just to show the reach of the work that we do together with um, uh, with Majid and, and Crescent. Today in Singapore, uh, we held the third workshop for a project called The Role of Oil and Gas Companies in the Energy Transition. Uh, it was held during the Singapore International Energy Week 2019 as part of their think tank roundtables sessions. 
uh, the workshop gathered a number of individuals from a variety of Southeast Asian research institutions and local representatives of international oil and gas companies and yielded key insights. I won't go into them here, uh, but they are issues that Majid has pushed us to look more closely at, which is how oil and gas companies actually can take a leading role and a very positive role uh, in an energy transition uh, driven by uh, 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 broadening and enriching the energy mix uh, through the companies that produce and market them uh, to uh, face challenges such as climate change uh, and, and other issues, uh, really thinking into the future. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Abbas and our panelists, but before I do that, let me uh, salute Will Wexler who has so masterfully led our Middle East programs, uh, Tuka Nusurat, his uh, principal uh, deputy, and uh, Stephanie Hausherr Ali, who has been instrumental in working with Abbas on this set of work around Iraq. So over to you, Abbas. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Abbas Kadam. I uh, direct the Iraq Initiative. Uh, thank you, Fred, for these wonderful uh, introductory remarks. And uh, we are honored to have an all-star panel today. And uh, you know, it is it takes that kind of an all-star panel to talk about Iraq and the complexities of this country. Uh, so, uh, without any introductions, uh, we will uh, have a uh, a discussion a little bit from the stage and then open the floor for uh, the uh, uh, the audience for questions. I'm sure everyone has many questions and uh, the uh, uh, panel will uh, indulge these questions and will answer uh, and uh, we, will, we will do our best to uh, uh, decipher or demystify what goes on in Iraq. Uh, I, uh, uh, we, we really have to recognize everybody in the room. All of you are friends and uh, people who uh, help us a lot with your presence, with your ideas. But I would be remiss if I do not recognize my good friend and the advisory committee member for the Iraq Initiative, Dr. Faisal uh, Estarabadi. Ambassador Estarabadi flew from Indiana to join us for this event. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, again, uh, the ambassadors and, and the friends, all of you are, are welcome here and thank you for being here. So let me go with the role of ladies first and uh, talk to uh, uh, Ambassador Randa Rahim. Uh, Ambassador, uh, you've uh, seen these, uh, these events unfold and uh, you are one of the people who have been in this town and elsewhere uh, very informative and contributive to the debate. Um, how do you see the trajectory of these, uh, these protests, their contexts, regional and international, and where do you think they are going uh, in, in terms of uh, their influence on the political scene in Iraq, government future, uh, possible changes, or are we going to have another wave of protests that will go home and then we will re, uh, live this once again, hopefully not, but I'm interested to know where you see these, their future. Uh, yes, lots of questions. Uh, first of all, let's establish that we are <coughs> at a crucial and possibly turning point in Iraq's political development. There is no question. I think from October 1st, the protests have created a new narrative, a new scenario, and projected a new vision for Iraq that we haven't had, uh, I won't say since 2003, we haven't had for decades. Uh, the protest started, of course, as a, a, a demand f of services, of jobs, and so on. But what was interesting is that as they progressed, and as violence began 
to be practiced against the protesters. The demands changed. And then they became a demand for, uh, you know, uh, holding people to account for corruption, uh, a demand for resignations and so on. And then the final thing was a demand for a wholesale change in the political system. So we really are now at a point where there's a direct ideological confrontation between protesters and between the political class that has vested interests. The protesters want complete change in all the principles, the system of governance that we've had, the electoral law, the, the, the constitution, elections, and, and, and a whole mass of uh, institutions and documents that were, in fact, at the basis of the state after 2003. They want an overhaul of all of this, and yet an overhaul is diametrically opposed to the political parties and to the political interests that have become entrenched in Iraq. So ideologically, not only physically, but ideologically, we have a confrontation. There have been attempts by the prime minister, by the president, of course by the Majaia, which has been perhaps the most outspoken and detailed in its address, there have been attempts to say, okay, we will reform. We will do the things that the protesters are asking for. But so far, there's no indication from the establishment that they really intend to go through this wholesale change in the political system. And therefore, if we don't have a breakthrough in this confrontation, I don't see we're at an impasse. And I think if the, if the institutions of government and if the political class don't respond, we are going to have a continuation of the protest. And my concern is that they're going to become more violent, partly because there are signs now that some of the protesters are so fed up that they're willing to go into armed conflict. But even more serious and more imminent, in my view, is that there may be a confrontation among political, armed political groups themselves. We've already seen some settling of scores, particularly among the Shia militias. And this has not been declared publicly, but it has been understood on the street and in, in political circles that there are these uh, efforts or, or act, actions at score settling. And I think that is the most dangerous thing that can emerge, that you have rival militias going against each other under the cover of the protests, but really trying to gain the upper hand in a situation of chaos. Thank you. We will go back to some of these and unpack them uh, in our conversation. And, and I would like to uh, turn to uh, uh, Joey. Uh, last time we sat together in the embassy in Baghdad, we had that beautiful, you know, outside uh, seating, and uh, you know, Baghdad was looking uh, more peaceful. I was that was in May 2019, and then I went back to Baghdad uh, in September and October, actually, I witnessed the first week of the protests. And I visited uh, Ambassador Tuller, and we were talking about how things were looking better. Uh, there were two forums in Baghdad in September. Both of them were talking about ec the economy and energy. And uh, unlike what used to be, normally conferences were about security and all of the other things. The green zone was open, and you could drive through, and it wasn't like you are driving through tunnels with the T-walls. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, something, uh, just one thing led to another, and it's like a volcano, and things changed completely. And I was <coughs> counting days, would I be able to get out of the Najaf airport on time before they take it over? That's in the nature of Iraq. But my question really is, you know, here from the American point of view, the United States has been the agent of change in Iraq in 2003, has provided time and again so many uh, 
assistance uh, uh, packages to Iraq on security and on uh, other aspects. Uh, there is some strategic framework agreement, uh, and uh, the, uh, the U.S. was instrumental in the help with the defeat of ISIS, even though the Iraqis did all of the heavy lifting and fighting, uh, but it was very important for U.S. and international communities' engagement. Uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, 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 made a statement uh, of support for, for Iraq in general. But my question is, where is the United States government now uh, s uh, stands in terms of uh, the, the protests, uh, the, uh, the uh, government measures, uh, and also uh, in light of the fact that you know, the United States uh, must be very careful uh, when the sensitivities of the region are important. Probably some people argue that the U.S. should not publicly mm -hmm. give any support for, for protests or any of that, so it will not be uh, viewed in different lens. But on the other hand, the U.S. has its own long tradition of support of, uh, of, of uh, democratic change in, in a reasonable pace, uh, which Iraq has been going on and off on. What do you see the U.S. government, uh, or, or where is the U.S. government position right now on both uh, these issues? Well, first of all, thank you for having us here, Abbas. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be with you and to be among so many mentors and friends uh, and to um, once again say hello to the uh, Iraqi viewers who are watching. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we are watching very carefully uh, and closely what's happening in the country. We're very concerned about it. Uh, I think you've heard us say several times uh, that we call for nonviolence uh, by all sides, that the rights of the protesters to demonstrate peacefully should be respected, and that the uh, demonstrators should also uh, not be violent, not be carrying arms. Um, because Iraq is lucky to be one of those few places in the Middle East where people can express their views loudly in the streets. And as long as they do it peacefully, this is an extremely good way for the uh, government to really know what its people are thinking and what they're passionate about and to adjust course. And we recognize that we have to be careful about uh, how we talk about these things because there's always people ready to criticize us and involve us in all sorts of conspiracy theories. But the reality is uh, that we remain ready to help uh, Iraq build a stable and strong and sovereign government, just like we've been doing. Uh, we think this is what the protesters want, and this is what we want as well. And we're ready to uh, work with the government in putting together uh, the, uh, any sort of reasonable response to the protesters' demands, which we started to hear some of from uh, His Excellency the President yesterday. We would be interested to know uh, what kind of timeline uh, he's thinking about. We would be interested to know uh, how we can be of assistance through uh, the international organizations or directly uh, bilaterally. We're ready to help. Um, thank you. Um, uh Majid, you represent a sector that is the most important sector in Iraq because if not all, then at least uh, the uh, you know, numbers go from 85 to 95 percent of the Iraqi revenues come from the, the petroleum uh, industry. Uh, and uh, this cannot really stand without the support and participation of international corporations that work in Iraq. Uh, and that contribute to the Iraqi economy. Uh, there are also other businesses in energy, uh, like the ones who will deal with electricity and, and, and other uh, uh, projects that Iraq is trying to, to accomplish, and also the, the rest of the, uh, the um, uh, industries. Uh, now, uh, stability is very important for uh, the, the work of these organizations and for your, uh, your uh, and, and, and companies, corporations. Yours is one of those, and you take a, a, an important uh, 
part of, of the Iraqi uh, industry there. Uh, there is also um, stability is not just only important for, for the international corporations. We saw even, you know, things like the sports events, you know, the, the Iraqi national team was supposed to play in Basra. And uh, then now I think it's either moved to another city or probably out of the country. Uh, so, so it is really, stability is very important. How do you think the, the uh, international business, um, whether they are investors or uh, uh, corporations who work in Iraq on the field, view this and what are their, uh, their, their uh, uh, sensitivities, their, their ap apprehension maybe, or uh, their fears, if you will, also uh, around the, the risk that can be uh, coming out of this uh, threat to stability and also to the continuation of the government. Thank you. So thank you for the easiest question so far. I am never going to I'm, do I'm, easy I, questions. It's I easier to, to talk academic. about to talk about you know Iraq taking what's below its gr the ground and and getting it up rather than unfortunately those who are above the ground being put into it. And I, I hope and pray that Iraq achieves more of the former and and less of the latter. So the the energy potential for Iraq is is huge. The proven reserves are 140 billion barrels of oil. That number, I believe, is uh, well below the reality. There's still a l hardly any exploration has been done. It's still very much uh, in its infancy, the, the industry there, despite the fact that we're in the 21st century. Uh, and despite all the challenges, Iraq is now achieving 5 million barrels uh, a day, half a million barrels uh, a day also from the Kurdistan uh, region. Really, other than the United States, it's been the big growth uh, of, of global oil production uh, and certainly the fastest growing in, in OPEC. And that is despite the lack of legislation, the war on ISIS, the internal political uh, wrangling over revenue sharing, the corruption, the lack of infrastructure, all those challenges. It has achieved such an incredible uh, growth and, and maintenance of production. So it just gives you an indication if it can sort out some of those other necessary things, what is really uh, possible. I think you, you, I mean, we as a company, we're certainly very committed to Iraq. We've never stopped producing uh, in the Kurdistan uh, region. We uh, were awarded three more blocks with the uh, federal government, uh, including Diyala. It's a difficult area which has been liberated from ISIS, but we feel able to uh, work there. And uh, it's really about uh, service delivery, and that's one of the big asks of the demonstrators also. Okay. I think jobs is key, and the fact that growth has been insufficient is one of the reasons, not only for Iraq, around the world you're seeing a lot of these demonstrations because of insufficient growth and job creation. But service yeah. delivery in Iraq has been a major gripe since 2003, in particular electricity. Uh, and clean water in the south was a big issue, especially in, in, uh, in Basra. And it you know, it is a shame that despite such amazing resources, that hasn't been uh, achieved yet. Uh, a lot of work is underway to try and, and uh, you know, achieve better delivery of these uh, basic services. But the political system also needs to get together uh, and take some strategic decisions and some political decisions. I think that the one of the things that's been holding back progress in the oil and gas sector is there isn't still this agreement to implement what's in the Constitution, which is revenue sharing, basically pro rata to population. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an attempt years ago to package all the legislation in together. Uh, it was unfortunately failed. It pro probably was too big an ask. Probably makes more sense first agree how you're going to share the pie. And then after that, uh, you, you, everybody has a, an, an interest in growing the pie. Right. Uh, and, and that's more on the investment uh, uh, laws. Uh, so there's a lot of work that, that still needs to be done, but no doubt Iraq has great potential in this sector. Well, let me follow up on this. Uh, and, and one of the issues that you have to deal with as international corporations and in the oil sector and in the petroleum sector is this lack of uh, legislation that can make things easier for Iraqis and also for their par international partners. Uh, 
in, in your sort of uh, uh, study and, uh, and, and closely following the Iraqi uh, uh, legislative system, what would make it easier for, for both sides? Uh, in, in other words, looking for something that is fair for both the Iraqis and for the, uh, the international corporations to be included in that law? So I think on uh, th there's, again, two separate uh, debates. One is the political one internally. How does Iraq uh, split the revenues from, uh, from the oil and gas? And the principle is clear. It's, it's proportional to population, population. but putting it in, in, uh, in place. And I think that needs, before you start putting drafts to parliament, there needs to be political agreement. Right. And, and, and that hasn't really uh, taken place yet. And then the separate one is about invest investors and, and uh, host government in terms of the fiscal terms. And uh, there has been evolution there. Uh, there was, uh, you know, complaints from the international oil companies about the original fiscal terms because they were, it, it wasn't just about the rate of return, it was the structure. Mm -hmm. It was a service agreement where it was cost plus the, and the investors basically became contractors, had no incentive to keep their costs down in fact, an incentive to increase their costs, right. but then very little incentive to, I to innovate and, and optimize beyond that because they got like a dollar a barrel or, or, or whatever it was. That's evolved, and the federal ministry with the last bid round and now their current model, which they got international expertise in, is more of uh, a typical investor type agreement. And very importantly also, they put a price on natural gas uh, and backed it up with SOMO uh, you know, guarantees, including with crude. That's very important to achieve investment in natural gas. Many countries, particularly in the Middle East, have failed to price the gas. Uh, and not surprisingly, there's very little investment in that, uh, in the, in that sector in the upstream. Iraq has huge potential in, uh, uh, in natural gas, not only to meet its own needs for power and industry, but also to be a major export exporter, both by pipeline and potentially LNG, if the market is there. Well, thank you for that. Uh, back to, to Rand, uh, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, I, I mean, I gave you so many questions and I realized that, but that's what we do as academics. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to learn to be uh, in, this, in this business. Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, because students, uh, you know, you, you need to really, uh, test what's there and, and that's, you know, how to go from talking to students to experts. That's a different story. Uh, but let me uh, follow up on, on, on my questions and also your answers. So what, what we go with, with right now with the protests, uh, people talk about t two scenarios that are most plausible. Either the resignation of Adel Abdel Mahdi as the demands of the protesters and probably even many people in the political parties, especially those who have their eyes uh, on, on his job and they think probably realistically they can have it. And there are those who are more interested in reform and they think that the uh, resignation of the government of uh, Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi will put Iraq through a long tunnel of um, constitutional vacuum. Maybe they parties would not be able to form another government for a long time. And then either you risk continued protests, and protests means uh, basically uh, a lot of more destruction. The, the country will be uh, halting uh, its, its activities for a long time, and that will hurt so many people, especially unintended victims like the IDPs who are waiting to have government get them back, and so many others. Uh, and the business as well that needs, you know, Iraq is signing contracts and they need to have those implemented on the ground to meet the protests. Mm -hmm. uh, so between these two, the resignation or the, uh, the continuation of the government and the parliament and have them be the agents of uh, change and, and reform, where do you lean and what do you think is the more realistic and more plausible uh, scenario? Well, I think it's important to always keep in mind that Adil Abdel Mahdi became Prime Minister as a compromise solution and that there was no uh, single block that 
nominated him. It was an agreement between uh, Sairun and and uh, uh, Bina, which is which is basic not Sairun Islah. Anyway, Muqtada Sadr's block okay. and uh, Hadil Amri's block, and so they got together and they chose somebody who was seen as an independent. In other words, not belonging to either of their political groups. And at the outset, this looked like a sensible arrangement. But and Adil Abdel Mahdi, of course, arrived as the prime minister with a legacy of a political system that has been hobbled and dysfunctional and certainly not um, not highly regarded by the population. So he did come with, the, with this baggage, or he, he had to deal with this baggage. The, the fact that he did not have the backing of a single major party, rather than being an asset, has now proved to be a liability, because there's nobody defending him. And even Muqtada Sadr, who originally actually was a great backer, came out openly a few days ago and said Adil Abdel Mahdi should resign. Now the problem is there are mechanisms. I, I don't think the resignation of the government or the dissolution of parliament and so on is going to create this vacuum and, and, and unknown future. The, the problem is, is not that. The problem is what is going to replace them. And if you are on, uh, looking from the perspective of the protesters. It is not enough for one individual to be scapegoated and to resign if, in fact, the replacement is going to be also somebody from the powers that be. They are looking for radical change. I hate to use this term. They want to see a paradigm shift in the politics of Iraq. Okay. So the resignation of Adil Abdel Mahdi on its own unless it's tied to a much more far-reaching and broader vision of reform, is not going to help. The dissolution of parliament and early elections, if we follow the same electoral law with the same or, or a similar type of uh, electoral commission and the same party law, political party law, and that's an, an important element. If those remain unchanged, we are going to reproduce the same type of parliament. All of those are not going to be the type of reform that people want and they're calling for. And, and not only the people, but uh, the Marjaiya has been very clear about the type of thorough, far-reaching, radical reform that is required. So to say Adil Ma Abdel Mahdi, I mean, we had the resignation of Saad al-Hariri in Lebanon, okay, um, fine. And, and, and Saad al-Hariri, this was probably a tactical move because there are others in the government that he wanted to get rid of. And so if he resigns, the entire government falls and so on. So he can get rid of some faces. But in Iraq, it's different. You can't have one man resigning only to be reproduced by somebody similar. And so what do I see? Uh, perhaps a resignation of the government. Adil Abdel Mahdi has offered to resign once a replacement is found, according to the speech by uh, uh, President Barham Saleh yesterday. Which came from a letter he sent on the 29th to Sayyid Muqtada Sadr, actually. That, that how right. the frame right. of it. Yes, you are now, right. Uh, the, 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 the talk is, and, and let's go back a few days, we, we really are talking in terms of days in Iraq now because mm, yes. every day and every hour things change. Um, there was discussion between Hadi al-Amri and Muqtada Sadr, and I an agreement that they should find a replacement for Adil Abdel Mahdi. Uh, there were reports by Reuters and others that on Wednesday, Qasim Soleimani was in Baghdad, met with them and said, no, you should not change Adil Abdel Mahdi. 
and had al Amri reversed himself. So there are all sorts of interests at play here. And the, the picture is becoming more complicated. Will Adil Abdel Mahdi resign? Will he not resign? If he resigns, who will replace him? And so on and so forth. I think an orderly transition with reforms in the electoral law, in the commission, in the uh, party law, early elections based on those, and a caretaker government, whether it's a government that under Adl al Mahdi or somebody else, but a caretaker government to see us through a certain period of time is, in, to my mind, is the most orderly way to do it. Now, the problem with uh, the president's speech, as you mentioned, is that it was a little short on detail, but I understand because they're going through consultations and processes, but more to the point, it had no timeline. If, as some people have suggested, that elections uh, should take place in two years, I can tell you that's not going to be a satisfactory solution. There has to be a, f a, a short timeline in order to light a fire under people and to keep their focus. So. Uh, is it going to be a revolution? Is it going to be an evolution? Um, perhaps by my nature, I'm more an e of an evolutionary person. But I think that evolution Thanks. needs to be anchored in extremely solid steps uh -huh. of reform, legislation, followed by elections within six months maybe, and then followed by a review of the Constitution. And, and that is uh, actually where the president's speech was leading also, is that everything has to be done through the constitutional framework because Iraq, unlike other uh, countries probably, and some other countries in the region where the only way you can have changes by some means that are um, uh, extraordinary, Iraq does have a process in place and still can serve for an evolutionary yeah. change, in fact. and and. Uh, Joey, may, oh, may, sure. May I just please. comment on, on this point? Article 64 yes. uh, of the Constitution, uh, which my friend Faisal knows by heart, um, not the article, the whole Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> article 64, which I've read and reread in the last few days, there are two mechanisms for dissolving Parliament because right. what Barham Saleh said was that I will agree to a to early elections yes. which presumes uh, a dissolution of parliament there are two ways of dissolving parliament either the parliament dissolves itself by a vote of two-thirds well they're never going to do that why should they um, or by a dual request from the prime minister and the president and that certainly is possible now the Elections are supposed to take place 60 days after the dissolution. That seems to be a short timeline, but it could be worked around. So it is possible to dissolve parliament. Uh, but I would like, I would have liked the president, who has actually been the person who has really been able to preserve his credibility with the population. And I think uh, Ambassador Estarabadi will probably push back on, on the reading of it because Article 64, it's, it's kind of the, like everything else in the Constitution. You have to really read it backward and forward and That's right. bring some friends That's to right. help you. Yes. Um, and yes. But what it is is basically uh, one of the readings that the Ambassador has uh, in, to it, and he is a legal scholar of uh, a, a great stature. I always defer to him on, on those. Uh, issues is basically that one third of the parliament can initiate the call and then two thirds to Requires dissolve. Requires a two thirds vote. Yes, and the other is the prime minister would request f the president would approve the dissolution of the parliament, but it has, and that's where the uh, ambassador goes. It has also after the president ap approves it, it has to have a two third of the parliament to approve that, which means really 
that there is no substance to this authority that the Constitution gives to the well, President. We, we, we can because at that. the end of the we day, it all rests it. in the yeah. Parliament yeah. to agree yeah. to, to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to do that. But I agree with you. 64 is, is really where. And also, the ambassador always brings, uh, was it 56, I think, or? No, 56, where it gives the Parliament a four-year term. And then, basically, you have to interpret one with the other. So we, if, I'm sure the floor will, will, uh, will, will uh, um, have many questions on that and, and from the audience. Uh, now, uh, Joey, uh, let me ask you, in, in light of the same uh, arguments that uh, Arand was making, is basically the United States here is looking at Iraq, and it has two uh, things, major areas to focus on. One of them is the internal politics of Iraq and where it is going, the, all of the U.S. investment in Iraq and blood and treasure and international relations or, or bilateral relations and all of what the potential of U.S.-Iraqi relations, but also the, uh, the, the regional security, regional developments, what goes on in Syria, Turkey, and in and, and, and general. What, are the, uh, what is the order of concerns the United States is looking at uh, from possible threats and risks and, and uh, 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 possible consequences of what goes on in Iraq if the scenario goes, God forbid, to something worse or if there is something that is going to be prolonged protests? Well, it goes back to our fundamental goal for our policy with Iraq, which is a strong, stable, and sovereign Iraqi government. Because if you've got that, then you've got um, a great environment for American businesses to work in the oil sector or uh, in other uh, sectors of the economy. If you've got that, then you've got a strong Iraq that can push back on, uh, as I've said before, it's totally abnormal for a special forces commander from a foreign country to be coming into another country and meeting with political party leaders and telling them anything. Uh, you know, a strong, stable and sovereign Iraq should be able to push back on that and say, get out of here. Um, and uh, to be able also to project uh, stability into places like uh, Syria by keeping uh, a strong uh, border and by uh, enabling counterterrorism operations across the border so that organizations like ISIS can't resurge. So th that's our goal, and, and what we're putting into it is well and publicly known, because we have to go up to Congress and say, may we have some money to do this? And so you can look up all these numbers. We're the biggest humanitarian donor. We're the biggest donor to security assistance to the Iraqi security forces. We're the biggest donor to demining assistance, and we have been for many years. What, what form does Iranian assistance take? Who knows what that looks like? How much money are they putting into it? How much money are they taking out? Nobody knows these things because of the way they do business. And we would like to see that change, and we want to see it change through a strong, stable, and sovereign Iraqi government. And I believe that that's exactly what the protesters are saying when they say, Nurid Watan. Mm -hmm. You know, they want a country, a nation, this this watan that can't really be translated into English uh, precisely. But uh, that's what they want. They don't want to be a battlefield. They don't want to be uh, an asset. They don't want to be a through way uh, for somebody else. And we completely agree with them. All right. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I would love to go for more, but I think uh, I need to give uh, uh, the audience the chance to also uh, ask and uh, see what uh, we can get in there or where we can get the conversation uh, going. Ambassador Suleiman. Yeah. Doug Suleiman, president of the Gulf States Institute and former ambassador to uh, Iraq and a good colleague of Joy Hood. Um, I'm afraid this is for uh, Ambassador Rahim, but probably for all of you on the panel. I have been struck that the uh, the demonstrations, the emotion has largely been in Baghdad and South. And one of the questions that I have is, what is the attitude and participation in the Kurdistan region, in Nineveh, in Anbar, in Salah Adin? How do other communities and the political parties that represent these parts of the country view and participate in this uh, protest against government inefficiency? And how are they participating in the discussions of potential reform? 
other than Barham Sala. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I, actually, this question is so central to the problems that ail Iraq. Um, I, I, and I've been thinking about this and trying to disentangle. Uh, first of all, let me just say preemptively that there have been, there was a demonstration by the University of Slimania students in support. Uh, there was also a letter of support signed by about 100 Kurdish members of the Kurdish intelligentsia in support. So whereas there have not been protests in Kurdistan, there have been statements of support. Uh, in the last few days, there were also in Ambar some small protests that came out in support of the protests in the south. Not their own protests, but these were solidarity protests. Uh, they were quickly snuffed out by, by, by ISF, by the Iraqi security forces. So going back to this question, why is it happening in the Shia areas? Well, first of all, because the Sunni areas in 2012, when they protested, they were immediately branded as Ba'athis, as terrorists, and so on. And they were mercilessly crushed by Maliki, if you recall. And then they were accused of being the pathway. Those protests in Ambar were accused of being the pathway of Daesh into Iraq. And so the last thing that the people in Ambar or even Salah al-Din or Nineveh want to, want to do is attract accusations of being Ba'athis, of being Daeshis, of, being, of allowing terrorists to come in. So they are very uh, uh, hesitant to expose themselves to these accusations. So that's one reason. I think the deeper reason is that the Shia feel this is our government. This is a Shia-led government. And we are Shia. And the, this government, this Shia-led government, and let's face it, it is, uh, came to power in 2003 to uh, respond to our grievances as Shia, to elevate us as Shia from the oppression of Saddam Hussein and so on. And, but while they have taken all the spoils, is Shia leaders, we have had nothing. Basra is in a, in a dismal state, and Basra is predominantly Shia. All the south is predominantly Shia. So, so there is a feeling among the Shia that this government, which is supposed to be ours and supposed to represent us, has let us down. Now, for the Sunnis, I don't think there is the same sense that this is our government. There's much more participation by the Sunnis now than we saw after 2003. And I think that uh, the Sunnis are much more part of the political process, the decision-making process. But for the mass of Sunnis, it is not yet something that they feel they can appropriate themselves. And then, of course, don't forget that all these, all these uh, provinces have just come out from under Daesh. They have their own problems. They have their own needs of reconstruction, of bringing home IDPs, uh, of reconciliation among themselves. So, they have a, so th there really is a distinction between, and this distinction goes at the heart, as I said, to the problems that Iraq faces today. And if, and if Grand Ayatollah Sistani picked up on this as well today in his sermon. Uh, I, I don't have the exact wording in front of me, but uh, it could be interpreted. One part of it is saying, don't forget, this isn't just about the Shia areas. This is about all of Iraq and all of the components of Iraq. And I thought that was a very important message to hear. I just wanted to build on something which uh, which Rand said that you know th 
constitutional reform, electoral law reform, these may all be required. I'm not an expert, but I actually think the Iraqi constitution is not perfect, but none of them are. It's not the only country thinking about whether you can get two-thirds votes to remove the chief of the government at the moment. <laughs> um, but but, uh, but uh, actually, A, those will take time, a lot of time, and B, I don't see how they're going to address the immediate needs of these demonstrators. Because actually, they're, the crisis of legitimacy in the Iraqi government now is not one of the democratic uh, legislation or the Constitution. Uh, and those who are asking for it, and there are some, see it as a way to change the whole system. But what they're really asking for is jobs, service delivery, and lack of corruption. And taking a year or two to change the electoral law or even reform the Constitution is not actually going to help with those. What I see the, where the problem lies is in the executive, in the de service delivery by, by the government is failing. And that needs a kind of, you know, emergency council on job creation, emergency sort of task force on electricity delivery, giving them the freedom, if necessary, some, uh, uh, you know, outside expertise and having an action plan and delivering and, and somehow keeping th those uh, immune to political interference and corruption and, and the kind of uh, pulling this way and that way by all the parties, which has so far stymied uh, the government's uh, uh, progress. Can, can I respond? Yes. Uh, I hate to disagree with you, Majid, but I think that the demands of the protesters have gone beyond asking for jobs and services. I think that was true on October 1st, 2nd, 3rd. But I think, as I try to, to show, they have changed. Now, keep in mind that I, I think it was October 4th, uh, the Prime Minister came out and said, we are going to create more government jobs. The government is already in deficit, and I don't. Know, and, and the and the public service sector, the public sector is bloated. So I don't know how they're going to create jobs and what they're going to pay f uh, for. How they're going to pay for them. The prime minister also uh, talked about a new package, an additional package, of social welfare. And in that speech, he tried to respond to the, to the services demands of demonstrators. But I think by then, we had gone beyond that. And I don't think any kind of service delivery, uh, they can't create better health overnight. They can't create better schooling overnight. They can't create a million jobs overnight. I think that takes more time than reforming the electoral law and I'm not talking about the Constitution, reforming the electoral law and having new elections and having a new government. I think that can be done in a shorter uh, a period of time. You also spoke about creating jobs and, and improving services uh, without the interference and the derailing effect of corruption. That you're absolutely right, but I don't think it is possible to do that always, unless uh, you have a major reform yeah. of the political system. Always, you know, this, uh, you know, you have the spark, and then you have the early uh, dem uh, demands, and then once people are on the street, they raise the ceiling, and then you know, just like in negotiations, and then you have to go back and. Uh, you know, so it's it's uh, this is going to be really uh, a uh, uh, an ever evolving uh, demands and counter or offers yeah. and counter yeah. offers, and also uh, there are so many moving targets, and and people are trying. Yes, Majid. So I, I you know I I think we are in in, in uh, agreement. My point was not that you can assuage these demonstrations mm. by the government offering to hire tens of thousands right. more. Right. My point was what they want, 
that you know changing the electoral law alone is not going to be yeah. Uh, yeah. enough. No. They see that as a means to an end, perhaps. Correct. But but actually, you need you you can't wait for that. Uh, I heard from a senior, one of the most senior Iraqi uh, politicians at the moment, and and he described it quite simply, quite well. He said, on the political front, we're actually kind of in a good place, and that there are two blocs in parliament, and each has Sunni Shia and Kurd in it, and that's <laughs> not where we were 10 years ago. But on the economic side, we came from a system of socialist, state, centralized control for three decades plus, where the citizen had no rights, no freedoms, but job security, service delivery, and, and, and all that. We took that away, and we declared in the Constitution an aspiration for a market-led economy with private sector-led growth and capitalism and so on. So we took two steps forward and, got s and stopped, right? So we either continue and achieve that aspiration or go back to what we have and really you know, become socialists again and support the citizen. Because if we stay in this limbo of this crony capitalism and dysfunctional state, they will not accept it and tolerate it. He said that a year ago, and unfortunately it now it's- a productive hybrid of, of the two. Uh, Ambassador Asarbadi, can we have a phone for, or I mean a microphone for Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very fascinating discussion. But if I could push back a bit, Rand, if I may. Picking up on what uh, Majid was uh, just saying, the last two remarks uh, he made, uh, you talked about evolutionary change and you being an evolutionaryist. Uh, you're not the only evolutionaryist uh, in Iraq. The parties are also extremely, the political parties are extremely evolutionary. Uh, we have had at least three different sets of electoral laws in Iraq, starting with the very first electoral law which the United Nations drew up for Iraq, which treated Iraq as a single district, uh, whatever it was, a closed list, et cetera, rep proportional representation. The basic parties that have been elected to parliament haven't fundamentally changed, notwithstanding changes in the electoral laws over the last 15 years. What gives you any, and that's precisely what the parties do, every time they the electoral laws change, they evolve to adapt to the new environment and come up to the top again. And we've been dealing with the same personalities, more or less, for 16 years. What makes you optimistic that changing the electoral law will yield any of the salutary results that uh, you hope for? Thank you. Um, it depends on what changes you make. Um, and, and this becomes a rather technical discussion, which I would love to have with you. But I think there have been some ideas floated that, uh, remember, it's not a bad thing to have political parties. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are political parties in all democracies. It is a question of how you elect your representatives. And I think there have been suggestions for an electoral law that is more reflective of the voters' choice. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to go into it because there are there are different models that are that are uh, being mooted. And I know that in Baghdad, that in the prime, in the president's office, working with Yonami and, and and so on, they are looking at options. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Will Embry from Dunkirk International. Uh, I fear that uh, you can't uh, fight somebody politically uh, with nobody. And I worry about the uh, demonstrations at the moment uh, have not coalesced b behind a, an, individu an individual uh, or uh, a set of principles. And I think, uh, Abbas, you said they keep moving the goalposts. Uh, and Ambassador, you said, well, things have changed from one day to another. To me, to avoid uh, falling into uh, more violence, I, you know, I think they really need a leader. They need a, a, a Gandhi, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, al-Assad or somebody to, uh, that can coalesce the opposition behind him uh, 
behind a single set of demands before they can move someplace. Is this right? So I, I don't know. We were actually debating this interesting right. global phenomenon now that whether it's Iraq, Lebanon, Sudan, Algeria, Hong Kong, Chile, or, or further afield, you don't seem to get leaders anymore. They get organized through social media. It doesn't mean they can't achieve change. And in the Middle East, you know, Sudan, Algeria, Lebanon, maybe Iraq, they've cha you know, brought down the governments. But what can you do, what can you achieve beyond that is not yet clear. But it seems to be, and I, I don't know the, the answer, that we live in a world where you don't have any more, or you maybe you don't need, I don't know, the Gandhis and, and the Mandelas and the, and the, the figures. But I, I defer to more experienced uh, well, I don't have more experience in revolution, but uh, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, but you but can I, think anyway. <laughs> I think that you can tie these things together. Uh, people are coming out and protesting because they feel that their elected representatives are not uh, reflective of their views. And so they're coming out and yelling those views. And so that's what a reformed electoral system needs to do, is so that people know who they voted for, who represents them in the parliament, who they can come and harass when they need something or they see something they don't like. I know who I can do that to in the US Congress who represents me, but no Iraqi can say the same about the Council of Representatives. Gentlemen, I'm sorry, you wanted to chime in. I just want to say that there are slogans or branding, if you want. They may not be individuals, but um, uh, Jerry Hood mentioned uh, Urid Watan. And I think that's a very important, and, and I translate Watan, it's not country, it's not nation, it's more like the Latin patria. So it's something that you owe allegiance to, that you believe in, that you, that you are emotionally tied to. So that was, this is a, has become a major slogan. And I think <coughs> that this type of branding, which is, I'm sure there are people doing th doing this and thinking up these slogans and so on, or Nazil Haqi, I'm going out to claim my rights. Um, I think this has become a, a, a sort of a, a glue for these protests that, uh, sure, it doesn't replace known leadership, but it certainly gives the protests a certain coherence. And I think that may be helpful. Gentlemen in the third row, right here. Yeah, I have two questions. One for uh, Ambassador Rand. Uh, Rand, uh, do you believe that uh, there is something missing in the demonstrations in Iraq, in the all protest, uh, the so-called Iraqi identity? Uh, do you believe that the changes that the demonstrators, they want, uh, is going to bring the Iraqi identity uh, rather than the Shi'i or the ethnic identity for, for the country. And my second question for Joey, uh, I'd like to hear your assessment about Muqtada Sadr. Do you believe he will be part of the problem or he gonna be part of a solution for all what's happening in Iraq? Well, Thank easy. you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Uh, you're done? No, yes, I'm done, please. <laughs> 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 I think, <laughs> okay, um, I'll, I'll answer. Please, go ahead. Uh, you know, I've been sort of really quite surprised. There's been sort of, for years, people say there's no uh, Iraqi identity, there's no national identity. Uh, and they say, they say the same thing about Lebanon that there's no, you know, nobody believes in a Lebanese identity. Everybody's just thinking about, well, I'm Christian, I'm Muslim, I'm Shia, I'm Sunni. I've always doubted that. I feel both in Lebanon and in Iraq, there is, in fact, a, a, an identity, but that it is, has been submerged by a political class whose interest is in fragmenting this identity and undermining it into primary allegiances. And I think one of the, the, the really good things about the 
protesters in Iraq. And, and similarly, I've, we've been talking about how Iraq echoes Lebanon, Lebanon mirrors Iraq, and so on. But I think the, the healthy thing that I've seen emerge in Iraq is that suddenly this Eid Watan uh, and the, all the slogans and billboards and flags that carry the Iraqi flag as opposed to any other flag and that declare no la ta'ifiya, no to sectarianism, uh, that this really shows that an Iraqi identity exists and that it's trying to break out from the chains or the pressures that have been put on it in order to fragment it. And I think this is an extremely healthy, healthy sign. And if there's anything that I'm really, uh, uh, you know, encouraged by, it is that. I'm also encouraged that Christians have also sh shown support. Some Kurds have shown support. People in, in Ambar have shown support. Yes, they haven't come out in protest for the reasons I, uh, that I try to explain that I believe in. Uh, but there is a national solidarity in the name of this Watan. Sahar. Uh, actually, this question is for Rand and for Majid, as Joey is my boss, twice removed. <laughs> um, Rand and Majid, do you think there will be a moment where uh, the political parties with armed wings would say, okay, enough is enough, and let's crush the protesters even more. Uh, Allah, what happened in Iran, in Tehran, in um, 2009, or in China in 89? You go first. No, please, no, no. Lady, <laughs> ladies first, I insist. Oh, dear. Because <laughs> you, you made, this is, you this made is a comment where earlier on about but you said they yes. would go at each other before but they... I said they'd go at each other. Mm. The political parties want to preserve their interests. There's no question about that. Now, how far will they go to achieve that? We've already had hundreds of dead. Nobody knows the, the exact number, because it's, um, but certainly hundreds, thousands of wounded. How far will uh, politi the, the armed political parties, I mean, there are political parties, the, you know, the Communist Party isn't armed, uh, but there are political parties that are. How far are they willing to go uh, to quell the protests? What will the backlash be? And I think, by the way, here, that the response of the international community is key because when the special representative, the, 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 uh, UNAMI, uh, the head of UNAMI, the special representative in Iraq, has produced two reports. The Human Rights Rapporteur has pu produced one report. Amnesty International has produced a report yesterday. I think the international community, uh, heavens, Mitch McConnell mentioned it I in the Senate yesterday. Uh, in Australia, it's been raised in Parliament. Uh, the, the response of the international community is going to be key to how far the repression can go. I, I think that is going to be a crucial element. Oh, I don't have much to the add to that. The answer cannot be yes. No, uh, I don't have much to okay. add to that. Of course, no, you know, everybody hopes and prays that there won't be violence and, and lives lost. and the sheer scale of the demonstrations and the fact that they are across uh, the, the South uh, gives them significant legitimacy and any uh, violence ag uh, against them will delegitimize whoever commits it uh, and their backers and, and that needs to be taken into account. I agree. I must let me be fair yes. to the gentleman in the middle there. Uh, I didn't mean to dismiss his question but uh, I th we're willing to work with anyone in Iraq who's willing to work for Iraq. And uh, I think what you're seeing Iraqis ask for now, too, is uh, the same thing, but also to disentangle 
religion, from politics, from uh, militias. All armed groups need to be under the control of the central government. That's a fact. Uh, and everyone agrees with that, uh, I think, between the US government and uh, the Iraqi government. The uh, disentangling of uh, religion from politics, we heard Majid talk about it earlier, how some of the coalitions and parties are now cross-sectarian. There needs to be more of that so that people don't look at a particular party or party leader and say, well, they're only for the Shia or they're only for the Sunni Arabs or for the Kurds or whatever. That's when Iraq will have evolved into a much more representative democracy, and that's what we want to support. Thank you. Dr. Hassan Nadim. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful discussion. I have a quick question to Majid Jafar. Uh, Iraqi protesters have been nonviolent, particularly in Najaf. Uh, just two days ago, I'm following everything. I'm, I'm sure that you are watching everything, every single detail in Iraq. Uh, just two days ago, I heard that somebody in Basra from the protesters calling to go to oil fields. Um, and we know that some of the protesters, you know, closed some, you know, city councils and in the name of the Iraqi people, you know. Is that, I mean, to what extent that you see this really serious and may influence the political scenes and the economy in Iraq? So, uh, I, th there, were, there were different reports. I can't claim to be fully up to date. I've actually been in the U.S. over the last few days and traveling quite a lot. But what I have read is that there were some reports that came out that said that workers had gone on strike. But actually, it turned out that they were demonstrating on their day off, <laughs> uh, which was amazingly responsible. So, so they did not, <laughs> no, I mean, they did not want to harm Iraq's production. But at the same time, they, they, they wore their uniforms. Uh, and that caused the confusion. They wore their overalls and their hard hats. And they marched together uh, with their company uh, slogans in, in support of with the demonstrations. But they did it on their day off. So so far, there hasn't been any uh, impact. There, there have been in the past, of course, uh, roadblocks, demonstrations outside field facilities. And this is because they know that this is obviously of huge concern to the government. And this will get international attention very quickly, uh, which it does. I mean, you know, in, in 79, once uh, NIOC's uh, w workers went on strike, the Shah fell within 24 hours. Because, you know, that's the lifeblood, as, as Abbas said, unfortunately, of these economies is, is still the oil and gas. But we haven't seen any uh, uh, impact yet. And, and uh, what we have seen has been peaceful protests and not violence against any international investors or, uh, you know, or around these facilities, as far as I've heard. Ms. Bayan Sami. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bayan uh, Sami Abdurrahman. I'm the KRG representative. Thank you. It's been a very educational and fascinating discussion. Um, absolutely, I think there's total sympathy and empathy with the protesters uh, across Kurdistan. Some of the political leaders have also made statements that their grievances are legitimate, also calling for an end to violence on both sides. Um, I want to make one short comment and then ask the question. I would argue that the Sunnis and Kurds have already had their protests. As Rand, you mentioned, the Sunnis previously did protest and they were crushed brutally. Uh, you could argue that the Kurdish referendum on independence was a form of protest. It was also a positive thing. Uh, we have a spirit of independence, I've been told, like Texas. Um, but also I think it was a protest. It was a protest against being not really part of the system and not really being represented. So I would argue that the Kurds and Sunnis have had their protests. They were dealt with in whatever way they were dealt with. Now it's the turn of the Shia, and I hope their protest will be listened to and will in fact improve things for all of us in Iraq, Amen. whoever we are. Now, my question is, uh, how would you assess to all of the panel 
How would you assess the reaction of the immediate neighbors of Iraq? Is their reaction a cause for celebration or commiseration? The media what? Immediate oh. neighbors of Iraq. Ah. How has been their reaction to the protests? You know I'm going to talk about Iran. Uh, Go ahead. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to assess the reaction of Kuwait, uh, you know, uh, to the protests. But, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen all the reports, as we mentioned earlier, Qasem Soleimani flying into Baghdad and taking charge and giving advice. Um, this is, if I were a protester, this is exactly what I'd be saying, I'd be pointing to, to say this is what I don't want. I want my own country. I don't want someone else coming in here and telling us how to run it. And I think you've seen from the uh, regime in Tehran over the years how they deal with protest. And um, the Iraqi people are saying we're not going to have that. Uh, there have been a couple of hundred deaths that we have deplored. And the Iraqi people have said, we're not going home. Uh, we're not going to be cowed by that. So I think if the Iranians are thinking of trying to handle uh, the uh, protests in Iraq the way that they do in their own country, they need to think again. And uh, I, I wish that they would not uh, interfere in this and allow the Iraqis to peacefully demonstrate and uh, tell their government how they feel. Um, if you sort of look around the, uh, Iraq's neighbors, who do we have? Uh, the Kuwaitis certainly do not want to get involved in any way. Uh, nor do the Saudis, or sort of we're moving, you know. Uh, the Jordanians, of course, are impacted because there's a disruption in Iraq which affects the the trade and and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm sure the the um, uh, Jordanians are also afraid that the the, the breakdown can uh, uh, allow Daesh to make renewed inroads in Iraq. And this is always a fear. Uh, then you've got Syria. Syria's got its own problems. Turkey, uh, which for whom the Kurdish issue is the paramount issue, as you very well know. Uh, and therefore, Syria and Turkey, that is their primary concern right now, which again leaves us with Iran. I would say Iran is the one neighbor that has uh, a direct, imminent interest in what is going on in Iraq. Uh, you know, I don't want to go too far in, in assigning responsibility, but when you look at the, you, when you sort of the, do a, a periplum of, of the Iraqi uh, surroundings, you will see uh, either people don't, either countries don't want to get involved, you know, just keep me away, or they're too busy with other stuff right now. So that leaves uh, Iran unfortunately, and Iran has a very strong interest in maintaining the status quo. This is a fact. Mm -hmm. So I don't have anything to add to the regional analysis. I think what's been interesting this time, every summer Iraq has had demonstrations which were triggered by electricity. It's 50 degrees, there's no electricity, mm -hmm. people are mm -hmm. fed up in Ramadan often, and you always had, and actually historically, you know, uh, when monarchy fell in July, as July seems to be a kind of hot month. What's interesting now, it wasn't triggered by that. Actually, Iraq had That's a much right. better summer of electricity That's this right. year. We're in November now. It's actually not a time when the temperatures are, and, and, and associated tempers are high. So it does seem to be really about, uh, as Ren said, there's something, you know, systemic that's wrong, that is felt that is wrong, and they need the system to change because the way it's going now, it's not delivering on, on their aspirations and, and needs. Right, and speaking of electricity, actually last night we lost power and I had all night long, and this morning I got ready on the candlelight and I never done that or so. <laughs> and then I was looking, I called Louis, and I said, we don't have electricity. He said, I will get to you once I finish Tahrir Square. <laughs> and then when we restore there, I will get to you. But it's, it's, you know, you are right. It's, it's, uh, it's really deeper than, than just electricity. We have one last question, and then I will have three quick questions, and we will wrap it up. Yes. Louis, by the way, was Dr. Louis Al-Khatib, the Minister of Electricity in Iraq. 
Uh, I'm Emily Meredith from Energy Intelligence. Um, Mr. Hood, I was hoping you could talk about, we've heard the U.S. Um, prevail upon Iraq to become more energy independent. Um, what you're, you have seen in terms of progress and what else Washington is looking for on that issue? Uh, well, I wish I could point to more progress. Uh, there have been uh, a few deals signed with um, European and American companies, um, but uh, we need to see uh, more progress uh, as quickly as possible. It's just unconscionable that Iraq flares so much gas into the atmosphere that could be captured and turned into electricity for its people, and then turns around and purchases electricity uh, and natural gas from uh, Iran. Uh, that's exactly like carrying coals to Newcastle. Uh, so uh, there are plenty of American companies with the technology available to help them do that. Uh, and you know, we think that's the best route when you're looking to reduce corruption as well, because American companies have a strong reputation for transparency. Um, but uh, you know, that I would also say that uh, Iraq has shown its capability, as you mentioned, Majid. Uh, it's uh, producing at historic levels. They've never produced this much oil. So things can be done. Uh, they, there just needs to be a serious focus on it. And that's, again, what the protesters, I think, have been saying, that nobody's taking seriously what we're asking for. Hopefully, they will now. So I think the, the, the key is to focus on cost, as far as the Iraqi budget, and reliability of supply. Uh, absent the politics, and uh, you know, Joe is right. There's plenty of of local gas resources which could fuel electricity. He mentioned the flaring in the south, but also in the center and the north, there's a lot of non-associated gas which could be readily brought on production. We're now producing 400 million cubic feet a day in the Kurdistan region. There are some uh, power plants that our affiliates built. One of them uh, just you know, less than 100 kilometers uh, within federal Iraq, which are needing uh, gas. We're taking our production up to a billion cubic feet a day over the next couple of years. And part of that could be supplied to uh, federal Iraq at a fraction of the cost of the imported uh, gas. Plus, you know, I mentioned these Diala blocks. There's gas fields there. Um, and uh, we've initialed those contracts over a year ago, still waiting just for the signature. So we can get on, and within a year, we'd be producing couple of hundred million cubic feet of gas. So dealing with the flaring in the south is definitely important, but actually the shortages are, are further north, and there's gas there, uh, non-associated gas there that could be rapidly uh, brought on. It just needs some decisions to move forward. All right. Uh, very short answers, but not yes and no. Uh, Majid, uh, Iraqi energy independence, is it a short term and uh, mid term or long term or Hopefully not, never. It could and should be short term. And by that, I mean a couple of years. Uh, it, it really doesn't, it really shouldn't take, you know, more than that uh, to enable self-sufficiency. Uh, and the import was supposed to be temporary anyway. At least that's how it was, uh, you know, uh, declared way back when. Uh, it, and, you know, coal, coal to Newcastle is exactly the, yeah. you know, when exactly. I heard some ideas, oh, maybe we import LNG or import from the neighbors. I mean, come on, that's, makes no sense at all. Joey, I know you have a, a, a meeting to go to. Uh, quick question, really. Uh, we s we're speaking about the possibility a couple of times, you and I, of getting the Basra Consulate reopened now with <laughs> the current situation. Do you think that we will continue to speak about it, or do you think that this is a possibility? Uh, Basra Consulate did a lot of great work in Iraq, actually, it did. and and uh, you know from the days of Steve Walker and then uh -huh. and so where where do you think that is? You happening? said I can't say yes and I can't say no. Can no. I say maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, no, the United States remains uh, committed to our presence in Iraq. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're building a state-of-the-art facility for a new consulate in uh, Erbil. Uh, so we're not going anywhere, but. Um, uh, right now, we can't talk about uh, taking the consulate off of uh, the s uh, suspension of operations, uh, but we hope to uh, be able to have that conversation soon when there's peace, there's stability, uh, there's a strong sovereign government that uh, is in charge of security throughout all of Iraq uh, and not other actors. And uh, Rand, uh, 
Do you see a, uh, a finish of a term of the government uh, or uh, Barham Saleh's or President uh, Barham Saleh's uh, uh, roadmap in his speech accomplished or the protesters will have their way? The, the, the roadmap of uh, Barham Saleh uh, is designed to meet the protesters' demands, but it doesn't go far enough and it's not specific enough. So if that is developed and if Barham Saleh can actually get the processes going and so on, then I think there is a possibility of you know, uh, 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 comforting the, the, the protesters. But uh, all I can say is I don't know. It's because things are dynamic, they're changing, and uh, we don't know. That's one we step far away from Joey's maybe. <laughs> so yes, uh, yes. <laughs> but it's, it's the honest. I think we have to be honest. It has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for our panel. Thank you all for attending and appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.